I have seen the face of terror. Felt the stinging cold of fear. And enjoyed the sweetest taste of a moment's love. I have cried, pained, hoped and prayed. But most of all, I have lived times others would say are best forgotten. And yet, at the end of my life, there comes a day when I am able to say, I was proud of what I was, a soldier. Understanding the Battle of Chump, 1971, an area we have lost repeatedly in 1948 when it was retaken, 1965 when it was handed back again in February 1966 after the ceasefire, and 1971 where it was magnanimously given after we had won a war. Sam Manickshaw, after the resounding success in 1971, had shared his pain with the troops. After the war ended, he went to Cham and addressed the troops in a darbar, where he expressed his dissatisfaction with the performance of 10 infantry division at their not being able to reach their offensive objectives in Pakistan and what's more, losing Cham in the bargain. At the end of the address, he asked the men if there were any doubts. A Havaldar from the Regiment of Artillery got up and asked his Chief of Army Staff, Sir, if you wanted to see us in Pakistan, why did you declare the ceasefire? There was a stunned silence. But everyone, including the Chief of Army Staff, realized the, the weight of the argument of the soldier, who had given his everything and lost his comrades in the battle, also thought that he had been cheated of a victory. And yet, Someone has to take responsibility for what has happened. From such an advantageous position, both from the military and the political points of view, how did the army and the politicians manage to lose Chubb? The army fights in units and regiments. Field Marshal Weber said, A regiment is more than a mere organization. It is in truth a family, with its ancestors and descendants, its pride and possessions. And through all its vicissitudes, has a strong sense of community and continuity. This is a painting of Mahadevi, the widowed wife of CHM Cheluram, who was awarded the VC on the 9th of April 1943, when he single-handedly charged the enemy positions in Tunisia, killing all the men and allowing the battalion to continue its advance after it had suffered huge casualties by a murderous machine gun fire. See how proudly his son is wearing the dead father's VC. The painting is now proudly displayed in the battalion officer's mess of the 4th Battalion of the 6th Rajputana Rifles. All the nine fighting arms and the 16 supporting services have their kasam parades. So whether it is Milka Singh on the start starting block of the 400 meter finals in the Olympic Games in Rome, or the infantry battalion at the start line of the company attack in Kargil, when the shooting war starts, every Jawan in his mind is only thinking of his cap patch. And his units, Nam, Namak, or Nishan. To understand the Battle of Chumb, we must historically trace the previous threats and encounters. In 1948, JNK was a princely state and Maharaja Hari Singh was to communicate to the government of India as to which country he would like to join. The state boundary was as indicated. Hari Singh had delayed the signing of the accession agreement and was facing an uprising in his Mus of his Muslim subjects in Punch. He had lost control of the western districts of his kingdom. On the 22nd of October 1947, Pakistan's P Pashtun rebels 
militias cross the border of the state and in, a, in an attempt to annex the state. The war was initially fought by the state army and the militias from the fr frontier. However, later, the Indian army was requested in by the Maharaja. Park regulars were also permitted to enter JNK and the action stabilized on the line of control between the two countries. The matter was raised to the UN and a United Nations Security Council Resolution No. 47 was passed and adopted on the 21st of April 1948. A five-member commission was set up to help the governments of India and Pakistan restore peace and order in the region and to prepare for the plebiscite to decide the fate of Kashmir. The plebiscite could never be conducted due to various reasons. However, the military restrictions were imposed and had an effect on the outcome of both the 1965 and the 1975 wars with Pakistan. The Commission's directions were, however, loosely implemented in verifying the ceasefire line. No wires or mines were permitted when new bunkers and defences were constructed. No increase of forces for strengthening of defences was allowed. And the Karachi Agreement of 1949 forbade induction of additional troops for construction or strengthening of defences in JNK. Let's have a look at the offensive capability of both India and Pakistan after deployment of the holding formations on the Western Front. These strike reserves by both countries could be used in a preemptive offensive or to exploit the success of the offensives launched by the holding formations. Pakistan had Army Reserve North with 6 Armoured Division and 9 Div at Kila Soba Singh. The Army River of South had 1 Armoured Division and 7 Infantry Division at Okara. The Indian side had 1 Strike Corps in the North which after ensuring the stability of the Pathankot Jambu National Highway had the offensive capability of just 54 Infantry Division and 16 Independent Armoured Brigade. The Army Headquarters Reserves to balance the Pakistanis ARS consisted of 1 Armoured Division and 14 Infantry Division, which were poised in the semi-desert oblique Punjab terrain. The Importance of Chumb Chumb is at the jun junction point of the ceasefire line and the international boundary and is hold, holding a critically important place as it gives each country the ability to capture strategic objectives without touching the strategic reserves. For India, a limited offensive launched could interdict the Sialkot Islamabad road and rail communications. For Pakistan, the capture of Aknur would affect to isolate 25 infantry division right up to Punch as also open a new threat to Jammu from the northwest. A few important terrain aspects. The terrain is typical of the foothills of JNK. The battle area is bisected by the Munnavar Tavi, which flows from the northeast from north to south, and in this season is fordable by tanks at Mandiala, Chamb, Dhar, and the Raipur crossings. There are just four important villages in the area. The villages of Palnawala, Mandiala, Chamb and Munavar. The Sukhtao Nala runs across from west to east and joins the Munavar Tavi at Mandiala. There is a class 24 road which services the area with a concrete bridge at Mandiala which had just been completed before the operations. The bridge is the only one that either side can use for the sustenance of a large body of troops across the Munavar Tavi. The defensive plan of Tendiv. Keeping this in view and the fact that the Chum salient was undefendable against a deliberate attack, the original plans for the defense of 10 infantry division were cautious and well conceived. 
The brigade commander was Brigadier R.K. Jasbir Singh from the erstwhile state of Jeet, a man who was loved and respected by the troops and eventually rose to become the vice chief of army staff. 191 Brigade was to hold the main defences along the line of Tamka Tila, Troti and Chak Bakroor. The covering forces, Papa Force, with five Sikh and a squadron from Nine Horse, was on conven commencement of hostilities prevent contact with the main defences for 48 hours. Quebec Force, consisting of Nine Horse, minus two squadrons, and a company each from 4-1 GR and 5 Assam was to operate in the area between the Manavar Tavi and the Chanab, depending on which side the threat developed. 52 Brigade was to reinforce the sector along the Troti, Troti line. However, the Indian defence plans for all intents and purposes were put into cold storage and the buzzword was the offensive. GOC Tendiv had managed to sell an audacious offensive plan to the higher commanders. The army commander, General K.P. Kendith, however, remained sceptical of the viability, even though he let the pre preparations go on. By October, the situation in Pakistan worsened considerably and there was a mobilization on both sides. Opposite the Cham Jongria border, the covering troops of 191 Brigade were ordered to be deployed in the first week of October. It was also a time when one corps was ordered to be inducted into the sector. On 7th October, whilst the GOC-1 corps was crossing the Ravi on the ferry at Thakurpur, he had met the GOC Major General Sukhwant Singh and made his oft-quoted remark, Our weakest moment is now. In another week, General, General Yaya Khan would have missed the opportunity. Since there was an acute shortage of defence stores, a considerable amount of improvisation had to be undertaken. By mid-October, at an operational briefing to the Corps Commander at the Headquarter 191 Brigade, Brigadier Jasbir Singh, in his intelligence appreciation, had said that his contact troops and local intelligence sources had identified 20 infantry brigade, 4 AK brigade, 2 regiments of armour, elements of a heavy artillery regiment, and integrated RT regiments of the two brigades opposite him. It must be remembered that at this time, the border was still open. There was no barbed wire fencing. Marriages across the border were still taking place. And the border was controlled by the BSF, whose control had just about stabilized, and the JNK police. GOC 15 Corps, however, stated that only 20 infantry brigade and a squadron of Sherman tanks need be inspected. The RNAW had also confirmed that the main threat to 15 Corps would be in the Punch sector. Induction of fresh troops continued. However, with the further ground inputs, GOC Tendiv revised his opinion on the park dispositions and advocated a more cautious approach. The Evolving Operational Plan On 1st November, the Chief of Army Staff visited the sector and offensives were discussed with the field commanders. The following additional troops were made available by the Chief of Army Staff. 72 Armoured Regiment, 2 Independent Armoured Squadron, a medium artillery regiment and an engineer regiment. After further discussions on the recommendations and insistence of the corps commander and the divisional commanders, the chief of army staff agreed to permit the deployment of the remainder of 191 brigade across the Manavar Tavi in the firm base. It must be pointed out here that the GOC Western Command was not happy with the deployment of 191 Brigade across the Tavi in an undefendable salient and put his 
apprehensions across to the chief of army staff. However, he was overruled by the chief of army staff as it gave a smoother launch to the offensive at a slight tactical disadvantage. And this is the deployment of the firm base that emerged at the end of the month. The division was well poised for its induction and breakout. The fighting arms were poised well forward and even the engineer companies were holding ground in the 191 Brigade sector. 52 Brigade was biased towards the Nadala salient and a para-commando co company was also holding ground. 58GR X-68 Brigade had been placed under command 10 Infantry Division. The BSF battalions were relieved of their frontline duties. Mines were laid in front of the FDLs and on either side of the Munawar Tavi. However, there are two major points that deserve critique. Firstly, the approach from the Nadala salient was boggy and did not favor the employment of large-scale forces vis-a-vis -vis the Northwest Thrust. Too much credence has been given to this not-so-dangerous approach. Secondly, nothing had been done to strengthen the firm base itself and give depth to it from the main direction of attack, that is from the southwest. The unmined defences of 5 Assam, sighted on flat ground, were highly vulnerable. By the time the corrective action was taken, it was too late. The Pakistani plan of attack was basically a repeat of their success successful plan of 1965. They expected the same covering troops west of the Bunavar Tavi and the main defences to be based on the throaty Chakbak road line. The plan was that 7 AK Brigade was to engage the hilly terrain held by 80 Infantry Brigade and 28 Infantry Brigades. 4 AK Brigade was to capture the area astride the Sukhtao Nala and Mandiala Heights and establish a bridgehead east of the Tavi. 66 Brigade was to capture the Gura and Fagla and link up with 4 AK Brigade in the bridgehead in Mandiala and the Chump Crossing. The Armoured Brigade was then to break out from the bridgehead by first light of 4th December and having captured Palawala to exploit eastwards. 111 Infantry Brigade, after having reduced the BOPs, was to capture the area of 303 and Chub. 20 Infantry Brigade was to capture the area of Munavar, Janda, and link up with 111 Brigade at Chub. With the limited assault bridging capability of those days, the plan gives credence to the bridging site at Chub. Commencement of Operations On the morning of 3rd December, approximately a squadron of Sherman tanks was deployed opposite Manavar and Janda between Hanj and Barela. All Pakistani villages were reported to have been evacuated. The news that Pakistan had attacked our airfields at Amritsar, Pathan Court and Srinagar and that we were at a state of war was conveyed to us at 18.30 hours. By midnight, the enemy had made contact with the main defences of 5 Sikh and 5 Assam through infiltration. All the available armour was deployed in an arc extending from Moel to Mannavar, except for the two tanks of the SHQ which were at, placed at Guda. In the meantime, reports had been trickling in from 28 infantry brigade positions north of Deva of enemy armour and infantry columns moving towards Gura and Mandiala. At 12.30 hours, the position at Mandiala North was reported to have been overrun, with the remnants of the platoon having fallen back to Mandiala South. 7th Kumau, X-68 Brigade was ordered to counter-attack Mandiala North. A Group 9 para-commandos were sidestepped 
to Madala East. Since 7 Kumau, X-68 Brigade was late, the Commander 191 uh, Brigade decided to counterattack Mandiala North with a company less a platoon from Malke Camp, but this was eventually unsuccessful. In the afternoon, the enemy attacked Fagla and Point 303 in a determined bid to effect a link up with the Azad Kashmir Brigade. Air support was asked for, however, own air support was negligible as the air effort had been prioritized for other sectors. Of the three missions demanded, only one was executed. During the night, 4th, 5th, Point 303 and Fagla were again attached. That night, the RHQ Troop 9 horse had been deployed to cover the Suktao Nala. The troop leader was my friend Surinder Koshik, who moved out in the hours of darkness with two tanks of the RHQ and was busy shaving in the early morning when he spotted the dust of the enemy columns due west. By then the news crackled in from the rover that the Mandiala North and the bridge were in enemy hands and the 216 medium gun position had also been overrun by the Azad Kashmir Brigade. But Surinder Koshik had a cool head and the engagement was swift and decisive and soon there were six enemy tanks burning the landscape. With all the pandemonium going around him, he afterwards grinned and said, it was like a field firing. They were so far away. The bridge was later recaptured by a counterattack by A Company of 5-8 Gurkhas and Kaushik's troop. Soon, the AK Brigade was in disarray despite the attempts of the Pakistani 66 Brigade to link up with, the, with them. The mopping up continued till 6th December. The en enemy continued the pressure on the Ghogi and Barsala positions, which were attacked more than once that day. At, si at 16.30 hours, the company commander of the 556 company at point 303 Major Dav Pannu was killed in action. By now, the fighting had been going on for 72 hours. Two to three attacks had been put on each of the forward positions. It must be realized that the attacking troops were fresh in each attack and the attacks were in depth with adequate reserves. However, there were no fresh troops to be put forward by the defender. Sleep de deprivation ammunition restrictions, administrative disruptions, air attacks and the constant shelling was taking its toll and the Indian soldier was being worn down. This surely was going to be the longest night. At the end of the day, with the intensity of the attack, the GOC felt that the brigade was overstretched and gave Commander 191 Brigade Two options. Firstly, to withdraw alongside 52 Brigade to the main defences, defensive positions at Throti. Or to adjust along the line point 994 Malke camp and abandoned Munawar and Janda. The commander 191 Brigade suggested that he be reinforced instead of withdrawing, to which the GOC readily agreed and gave him the following additional resources. 5-8 Gurkhas, lesser company, which were deployed on the bridge, A Squadron 72 Armoured Regiment, and 10 Garwar was placed under command 52 Brigade. So that a clear picture emerged for the main battle at Throti. Also, with the intensity of battle and the proximity of the opposing forces, the gun areas had become vulnerable. There was a need to re relocate field artillery east of the Munnavartavi. This was done on night 5th, 6th. And during this period, the frontline units at times had only nominal artillery support. You can imagine the guns, tractors, trailers and first line ammunition of the three units 
being ferried across the Manavar Tavi on the four crossings at night. At about 20-30 hours, the enemy had managed to overrun the Ghogi position. Five Assam was fighting from open trenches and suffered heavy casualties. Five officers and a number of other ranks were killed. An immediate counter-attack was launched by the unit and the position recaptured. However, the company commander, Major Markin, was killed. During the night 5th 6th December, the enemy either demonstrated in front or attacked most localities. Five sick positions, but particularly 303, receiving special attention. By then, captured documents confirmed the order of battle of five infantry brigades and the employment of almost 11 to 12 regiments of artillery. This was therefore not a local preemptive offensive but a deliberate attack by a strike corps. At 0630 hours, the enemy at last managed to capture point 303. The remnants of the company fell back to the brigade headquarters. A counter-attack with a company of 5-8 GR and a platoon of 5 sick from the north via Sakrana was immediately ordered. Nine horse was ordered to attack 303 at the same time from the direction of Kherwal. B Squadron recaptured point 303, meeting only a token resistance. The enemy had managed to push in two tanks through a minefield lane. These, however, were destroyed. Between 6.30 and 10.00 hours, the enemy launched coordinated attacks with infantry and armor against all three companies of 5 Assam and 4-5 GR. He managed to penetrate between the dummy minefields and FDLs of the Ghogib company, which suffered 5 killed and 33 ORs wounded or bleed missing. By 1400 hours, point 951 and Barsala fell in quick succession to enemy armor. The whole of 5 Assam defended locality was now in enemy hands. Headquarter 45 GR had been forced to abandon their position when some armor was observed moving from Singri towards Chak Pandit. The remnants of the company at Nagel, 5 Assam, also withdrew east of the Tavi. Wireless communications had been disrupted and the news of both battalions falling was conveyed through artillery channels. A little later, Mandiala North was reported lost. The armor was deployed accordingly with orders not to permit any further ingress. It was anticipated that the enemy would not advance further during the night and even if he did, some token resistance could be offered by the Brigade Defence and Employment Company at Cham. At 1900 hours, GOC 10 Infantry Division, after con consultations with the Corps Commander, ordered the withdrawal of the Brigade from the west of the Tavi to their main positions in Troti. This withdrawal was completed by 23.30 hours. To pick up the battle seamlessly, the GOC had deployed 68 infantry brigade along the eastern bank of the Tavi. With 7 Kumao holding the Mandiala crossing, 5-8 GR astride the road and 9 Jats on the Dhar crossing. 10 Garwar Rifles X-62 Brigade was responsible for the Raipur crossing area south of the brigade so that the brigade picked up the battle seamlessly at Troti. However, the enemy did not make any progress during the night of the 6th 7th December. The area west of the Tavi was finally occupied in the early morning of 8th December. The time plan for the enemy attack had been completely upset. However, the in the morning, the GOC ordered the Commander 23 Armoured Brigade to capture Palanwala as planned and desired the attack be launched within 90 minutes. However, 
the attack could not be launched as the brigade was not balanced. The artillery began its bombardment as per schedule at 0030 hours and continued till 0130 hours, but the attack did not materialize. A further postponement was made to 0800 hours on 8th December. A half-hearted attack was eventually launched by two companies against 10 Garhwal rifles at Chhatti Tali. This was easily beaten back with very heavy losses to the enemy. On 9th December, General Iftikar Juneja's helicopter crashed, killing the general. He was the highest Pakistani ranking officer to be killed in battle. The command of 23 Infantry Division now devolved on Brigadier Kamal Martin. While some attack demonstrations continued against 7 Kumao, 58 GR, and 9 Jats, they were easily beaten back by accurate artillery fire. It was only during the night of the 9th 10th that a coordinated and determined attack was launched by the enemy on the localities guarding the Dhar and Raipur crossings. The Pakistanis had infiltrated through the high Sarkanda grass on either side of the Munawar Tavi and positioned themselves for the attack on the depth companies. At 0600 hours, both 10 Garwal and 9 Jab Jat companies in depth were attacked and the 9 Jat company was overrun with very heavy casualties. A bridgehead of approximately 1700 yards by 700 yards had been secured by the enemy. The Raipur and Dhar companies fell back. A counter-attack was launched from the north with 3-4 Gurkhas and 9 horse to capture Dhar. However, the tanks were bogged down in the soft ground as the CO 9 horse had predicted and the attack fizzled out. The confusion was compounded when the communications with the forward companies in the ta along the Tavi were lost. At this time, 10 infantry division headquarters, there were discussions underway on the withdrawal of the two brigades to depth positions. However, the GOC 15 Corps flew in and quickly assumed control of the situation. As an immediate measure, he ordered a counter-attack to be launched from the north with, the com with a company from 5-8 Gurkhas and 7 Kumao for re recapturing the Dhad posi positions. At the same time, 10 Gargahal was ordered to counter-attack Raipur crossing from the south with a company. Two troops of armor, X-72 armored regiment, were also made available. A very elaborate fire plan was made, with both the corps and the divisional commander, both gunners. This was clinically executed down the line and had a devastating effect at the target end and ended in a crescendo of destruction. With the absolutely clear bomb line on, of the Munawar Tavi, the Air Force was able to clinically cause accurate damage and give excellent fire support. Depth targets were taken on by subsequent waves of aircraft. By now, the enemy had suffered heavy losses, particularly in armor. Six tanks had been lost while crossing of the Tavi itself. At 12.30 hours, all Pakistani troops were beaten back from the east bank of the Munawar Tavi. The area was secured by 1900 hours and the situation completely stabilized. After this, the enemy made no further attempts to cross the Tavi and a determined preparation of the counter-offensive by our own troops continued till the declaration of the ceasefire on 17th December 1971. Let's now try to analyze why in 1971 Despite everything being in our favor, militarily, politically, economically, internal dynamics-wise, timing and commitment, why did we have to lose Chubb? 
Was the Indian soldier really motivated and prepared enough militarily, psychologically and mentally for the Battle of Cham? One of the greatest indicators of combat preparedness, intensity, motivation and grit in an operational theatre are the battlefield casualties. Let's do a casualty analysis across the entire Western Command Theatre during 1971. In the 15 core sector in the north, over a frontage of approximately 1500 kilometers, you had just 180 men killed. In the one core, with the offensive in Shakargarh, where the entire core was used, you had just 300 men killed. In 11 core, or over a frontage of 3000 kilometers, you had just 371 men killed. And on this little dot of chump over a frontage of approximately just 30 kilometers, where there were just three brigades used, you had the astounding number of 430 men killed. Imagine the grit, courage, strength, determination and the desire of every man to hold on. Also, nowhere in the sector did the enemy ever get an inch of space without paying very dearly for it. Could you have asked these brave men for a greater sacrifice? Conduct of Higher Command The conduct of Higher Command was exemplary, both within the hierarchy at Army Headquarters where you had the Chief Designate General P.S. Bhakat Victoria Cross, as also amazing field commanders like General Sagat Singh. The fact that the three major commanders Commander 191 Brigade, GOC 10 Div, GOC 15 Corps reacted to the intelligence input and the political posturing and during the battle did not give a single inch uncontested speaks volumes. There was never a place on the entire battlefield front where the enemy reached absolutely uncontested. It speaks volumes for the reactions and the use of reserves. The fact that all reached the equivalent rank of an army commander reiterates the confidence in the system. The research and analysis wing and its performance. The French intelligence chief, Alexandre Ranches, regards Cao, our RNN AW chief in 1971, as one of the five greatest intelligence chiefs of the 1970s. RNAW carried out several critical functions during the 1971 war. It supplied crucial information to the army and the government that aided both the diplomatic and the on-ground decisions. Through the 18-month run-up to the 1971 war, Kao delivered relentlessly with the Mukti Bahini and the handling of East Pakistan. However, in a very fluid situation in West Pakistan, the Punjabi Muslim psych was misread, as despite the intelligence being received by the army from their ground commanders, the RNAW assessment confirmed that the main strike in the 15 core sector would be in the hill sector and not anywhere in the plains. Had the main threat assessment been correct, the Munnavar Tabi salient itself would have been stoutly defended for a much longer time as 68 Brigade would have been used for the counter attacks and stabilization of 191 Brigade in the salient for, for which it had been specifically tasked instead of being left out of the initial bat battle at Aknur. Political Direction The government throughout the run-up to the operations had planned a preemptive strike in the JNK sector. On 1st December, tentative operational deployment became a comp compromise between the offensive and the defensive po posture. Maps, plans, psych and mobility, which were geared up for the offensive tasking for three months, were changed in a flash. Numerically, in the last three months, the task of 191 Brigade alone 
was changed four times and the defensive task finally spelt out on the 1st of December, just two days before the commencement of the operations. General Clausewitz, on his publication on war, had said that the object of war is not victory, but enduring peace. Most wars fall short of these standards. The Indo-Pak conflict in 1971 certainly did not achieve peace. The Shimla Agreement, after intense negotiation and almost a complete break breakdown, was signed in 1972 with all its hope and fan fanfare. However, for all the soldiers who fought in JNK, it was a body blow because of the inclusion of Clause 6 of the agreement, which said, let each side retain the territory captured by each other in the Jammu and Kashmir while withdrawing to their own side of the international border. Clause 6, Sections 4 and 5 of the Simla Agreement. However, for the soldiers who were killed in action and their families, there will be no reprieve until the return of Chambh.